everyone in our world treasures him because he refuses to make a fuss. He disdains fanfare and flattery. There's an intense calm at the center of his being, a sense of self-truth. He is a man neither in need or in awe of fame. And so in some ways, this evening must be hard for him. But no one, no one ever deserved it more. Natan, your career is an honor to music. Thank you. And so it happened, in the 73rd year of his career, that Natan Mironovich Milstein, who has so studiously avoided fanfare and publicity all his life long, found himself in the brightest of limelights. I never have publicity for this, for the sake of, never. I didn't know what it means. I didn't have, I wouldn't know how to do it. I, I could, I'm not, I have enough brain to do it. But something stopped me because my mother said that. It's very difficult. How do you remember your mother? Lovingly, lovingly. I love my mother. I love the way she looks, she, she was, she, the way she talked. She was very beautiful. And... Uh, How did she look? <laughs> I can't, can't describe that. She had something, <laughs> sometimes, there's a type that I said, now, I remember I was in Lucerne, and I went to, to eat something, not far away from the place that I, the concert took place, concert house, and there was a, a lady, and she looked almost like my mother. And I, loved, I didn't want to go away, but I did go away. What did you learn from her? What she taught me, she said, be always yourself. Don't compromise, especially in music. I try to do, that's all. His unwillingness to compromise and his determination to find his own way of doing things have created some interesting situations with conductors, that most natural of tension points in a soloist's life. Beginning at the age of 11, in 1914, with Alexander Glazunov conducting his own concerto. And I came on the rehearsal and I played and there was a moment that I did something different than what 
from what is written. And then they had those such moon glasses, you know, and he looked at them like that. Don't you like what I, I did? I said, no, no, I can. And then at the end, after the rehearsal, he said, play the way you played before. Not all of his encounters with conductors have been quite so encouraging. But some of them have at least been entertaining. You know that Klemperer was a very good friend of mine. And he was one, I consider him one of the greatest conductors ever lived. Not I, but many people. And once I played in Montreux, and he conducted. I don't remember what, probably Madison Concerto. And the, the manager, the organized festival in Montreux, asked me to play an uncle. And I went to play. And then Kremper came and said, Milstein, that, he said in Germany, this is not a solo recital. This is a symphony concert. I said, look, I, don't, I didn't know the manager asked me to play, I played. And then, a couple of months ago, I played in Zurich, Beethoven concerto with him. And well, after the first movement of the Beethoven, before the larghetto starts, he looks at me. I'm quite comfortable there. He approached me and said, Milstein, aber heute keine Zugabe. That means today, no anchors, huh? <laughs> Very convincing. Who was the best conductor you ever played with? Furtwängel. Furtwängel. What did you play? Dvorak. Dvorak? Now you cried in Dvorak, no? Slow movement? No. A little bit. I come. think Czechs cry. Ah. Czechs cry because they feel that music Czech. They skip. I don't mean cry. I mean a little stoch in the stomach when yeah, you play. Yeah, but it's very difficult to understand, but I'm not that type. Yes, you are the type. Now you're telling me what I am now. <laughs> Why shouldn't I? <laughs> you won't tell you're me, so I'm telling you. <laughs> no, really. Like, Nathan, do you yeah. have a little stock when you play sometimes this, this music, no? No. What I -da -da, -da -da -da. No, nothing? Just fiddle? But I like slow movement. After the variations of it, this touches me, this I could cry. I don't cry with tears, but I have a feeling for that. When I played in Vienna, my manager was a young manager, not much experience. And it was also very early, 1930, I didn't have much experience. And my manager organized a recital, and I had good success with the recital. To such extent that the review of the New Press, press was glorious. And then he has decided to make a second recital. It was sold out. Then he wanted to make three concertos with some good conductor. It was difficult and that nobody plays rarely three concertos. Beethoven, Brahms, Tchaikovsky. And uh, he wanted a conductor. At that time, Franz Schalk was a wonderful conductor and very sharp wit. And um, he said, I play only with Huberman. And then eventually he found out that I was good and the review was wonderful and he accepted. Then comes re rehearsal. I was so frightened. Because I knew how witty is, sharp he is. He might have said something wrong. And I played the introduction, and, and after I started the cascade, after the first team comes back, he does like that. And I thought, that's end, that's no more. And he says, I hate something nice to say, but it's was beautiful. I hate something nice to say. Can you imagine such a friend? He said, I don't like to say nice things. Then he encouraged me. I played well, very well then after that. Because even when you're young, you can just be the, you can get, it's all to say courage, courage, but if you 
get a slap on the face. It's very bad. True to his convictions, as always, he has done a great deal to encourage others, particularly young performers, often remaining in the role of friend and mentor long after their professional careers have been established. Why are you so wrong? Pagayini did the press of us. Good. He is here working with Yuri Nagai, who has been coming to him for guidance for more than 10 years. It's not completely well because you are so rushing, excited. Control. I think his mind is uh, every second he's new. He's thinking how to go up every second. I'm, I don't think he's go thinking how to go up, but he's always thinking how to make better. I think, I think he has done it every second forever in his life, perhaps. I think that is very interesting. That's a very special thing, I think. I think s many people in every field who does very good. They would, when they do something very good, they would think, oh, I did very well, and they would be satisfied. But I think in his case, every second he's thinking better. Always better, better, better. He never think, oh, I'm so far away. He never looks like that. So it's, in his music also, every second he's new. Every time I play, he tells me new fingering. It's too much confusing, maybe. <laughs> but uh, when fingering is new, peace becomes new also. So you start with new mentality. It's, of course, much difficult to just play the same things 100 times. He, even when he plays 100 times the same piece, he plays different piece because different fingering, different uh, moment. Every moment he's new. You know, that I learned a, a lot. For me, uh, Each year, last 10 years, towards the end, he's, for me, he's even better and better and better. That is also amazing. I met him after he's perhaps 72 or something. But to me, he was better and better and better. Of course, I don't know him before. I cannot say anything. But uh, yeah, he was never got old. He was always like, uh, you are born now. <laughs> you are interested. Don't make accents wrong. Why is your scared sound always? Freedom. Younger people now play faster. I must say, when I was young, I played very fast also. To such an extent that when I went to Professor Auer in Odessa, my teacher Stolarski brought me to, to his hotel. And I played, he said, play Bach. 
and I played Prest of Bach. Prest of Bach doesn't mean that you have to run away. But I did run away, being young. And I would try to do make a rhythm so that I will not, not, not uh, disappear suddenly. But now it's, there, are more, there are more young people playing, that's why the more young people play fast. <laughs> that's when did you start to slow down? Can you, why don't you ask me when do I started to grow up? Yes, when did you start to grow up? I don't know. If you have to a gift of growing up, because people don't sometimes grow don't grow up. It's a gift also. You have to grow up to be a mensch. Some people don't. I did. You also say in the book that when you get older, it's not enough to practice the technique, you need to make other changes to your interpretations. You have to think differently. How to do it? You have to, you have to be able to invent ways of doing it better. Not only practicing, obviously you have to practice. But to invent things, how to do better. His ability to invent new ways of doing things has won him a reputation among musicians for being particularly gifted with bowings and fingerings, often making the most surprising changes at the most unexpected moments. Do you sometimes change the fingering even on the day of the concert? During the concert, very often the musicians in the orchestra, they play the first stand, they, they rehearse, the first time we rehearse, I play, let's say, first few minutes, one fingerings, and then a half an hour, the same spot. They couldn't believe it. But I was very easy, for me it was very easy. That's not quality. It's nothing to do with artistic quality. It's a comfortable. You didn't play original boy? No, I'm not. Because I played it. You are what in my opinion, tira, tira. When you do tira, pam, pam, then you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But I thought you played original Boeing. I don't know original. Every Boeing is. Look. Who made the original book? The original, no. <laughs> David. Uh, David, you're right. But Mendelssohn did too. Mendelssohn knew a lot about Boeing's. Not, not as much as I do. You did very good Boeing's for that. Ah, that's a different story. Now this is... I see that... I think it's the ear. Sure. 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 It's too, too sweet. Sorry. Because well, I'm Zuckerman, what can I do? <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> you probably always say that. Because I like to play with the fourth finger. It doesn't matter. I like but that sound. Da, da. I agree with you, it's a good sound. But that serves the. Wrong. Yeah, but open string I don't like. But you'd make modest yes, yeah. piano. I oh. changed my mind a few years ago. Mm hmm Okay. Where are your fingerings? Do you have them in in a in a part? I never have to take big Erickson. Because I change all the time. <laughs> sure. <laughs> But that's a lovely one, it looks so good. Very good. Yeah. Mm. In 
enjoyed that. Well, I have a very long stretch this way. The Paganini also. Yeah. This also I have very long stretch, so I don't do two four. I do three four all the time. Ah. So I'm lucky. Very lucky. Pag yeah. Paganini was lucky. He had very yes, he was. <laughs> Therese Milstein, when did you first meet Natan Mironovich? When I first saw him or met him. Because at the age of 13, my parents took me to a concert in Bucharest. That's when I heard him the first time. And my heart went like this. <laughs> it was just the age when you start looking at me. But then I met him in Paris. Actually, I was sitting in a box with his former wife. I went to school in Paris, and the people who uh, represented him, Theo Isai, were friends of the agent in Bucharest, who my parents knew very well. And I was allowed to be taken out of the school, pensionnat, for afternoon concerts. So I was in the box of Theo Isai, where his first wife was there. She was dressed up beautifully and a um, former model. And I was in my school uniform, that's number two. <laughs> Number three, we met again in London at the party after his concerts. We were both married, so that was that. Number four, we went to New York. I divorced, he divorced, and I went backstage and we discovered that we are both alone. So he started calling me up and taking me to concerts. The opera, and two years later, we fell in love. And then we married in 1945. With Nathan, we are married now 45 years. I never had a dull moment. Even now, you know, I don't know what he'll do an hour later because he changes his mind. What did you like about him when you first met him? Many things. First of all, his looks. He was very good looking. He was slim. He had gypsy eyes, which appealed to me. <laughs> uh, his great talent, of course. I was, each time he played, I was shaken. And also his honesty deep down. He never said a lie in his life. He doesn't know what it is. He never gossiped. If you tell him gossip to him, five minutes later, it's gone, you know. So I had great respect, and that's important. What does he do now? That since he hurt his hand, what does he occupy himself He makes with? arrangements for violin, from orchestra pieces, from uh, piano pieces, and that keeps him busy all day because he's so passionate about it. His transcriptions developed from his passion for the violin and his exceptional mastery of the instrument. But they began with a concert in New York and a set of variations on themes by Paganini which have become known as Nathan Milstein's Paganiniana. I made variations on Paganini, and I was, for many, many decades, trying to make it. But I didn't have courage, not, I was very busy playing myself. But once in the recital in New York, I need a piece of 10 minutes. And I gave the program, I said, look, that will be Paganini variations, my own. And up to the day before the concert, I was trying to do. This is the main team in Duncan. Then variations. 
But I use the material from many caprices of Paganini, the concerto, campanella. But I made a little bit, I added variations. And then some variations I emphasized more than Paganini did. Very good, Rahman, I love that. I like myself. I scratch that violin at that moment. Now I don't scratch anymore because I can't play. I hurt my hand. He can no longer play the violin, but inventive as always, he's now making piano parts for Paganini Caprices. What's the piece, Nathan? What? What is the piece? That's Paganini Caprice. I make a piano part, it's very good. Looks wonderful. Because you see, when you play, uh, only piano, uh, violin, some harmonies go lo got lost, get lost. Because, yeah, but, but Voice is very good. When did you start transcribing? 1932. Why? How? Uh, because um, there were always many things in my mind about pieces that didn't give the maximum effect of the subject, of the music. And then I used to make, I made some arrangements, like for instance, Mephisto Waltz. This I made already lately. Because already, but the idea of doing it came to me when I heard my sister play the Mephisto Waltz. True that she didn't play very well. But even later, Mr. Horowitz played quite well. But that was noisy. That was not, Mephisto doesn't scream. He's conniving in a corner with him. For me, it was violin better devilish than piano. Pian, the pianist sits so comfortably on the chair, but the violin is sent up, and you can make all kinds of gestures. But if you do all the piano gestures, you miss the music. Anyway, I did it, and it's very, very good. And some of my colleagues played that. No, but the thing is, that's very important. First, you should be convinced that the music that you want to describe on the violin will be better than on the piano. My, my Mephisto was is not better. It's better only in um, 
in the idea. Mephisto, it's good on the piano, but that's not Mephisto. But on the, on the violin, that's, it's more effective because that's more tricky. Piano is always precursive. Here you can do ponticello and spiccato and everything. And that's very good. And uh, many good pianists, uh, Barenboim and uh, Serkin, they, they loved it. And who am I to contradict? <laughs> but uh, then I made, at the same time, uh, list also. Um, Natan Mironovich Milstein was born on the last day of 1903 in Odessa, a very musical town on the Black Sea, which has produced an extraordinary number of talented sons and daughters. In our town, it was very musical. We had Philharmonic Orchestra, Symphonic Orchestra, and then Opera Orchestra. They very, everything was good, because the Odessa people were very smart musically. The conservatory, wonderful, teachers, wonderful. And uh, obviously that the result is that people attracted talent and they, for Italian, produced quality. Do you remember the first concert you went to? 
that I went to. No, the first concert I went with my mother took me to Heifetz. I, I start my book like that. But um, how was it? I I went. I didn't know anything. I was very young. I was not yet seven. Seven. I always say seven o'clock. <laughs> no, it was in, Heifetz came to play with the orchestra. And it was not only Heifetz. Before the age of eleven, in Odessa, he had also heard Jan Kubelik, Bronislav Hubermann, and Eugenie Zai, all of them legendary violinists in their own time. Zai was very famous already, and our pupils at the conservatory were very anxious to go in, and you couldn't get a ticket, even if you could get we didn't have money. What happens that we divided our group in two. One group will make noise while the other group will go in, so that police is diverted a little bit. And that was very successful. And I told Isaiah in, 19, in June 1926, he couldn't stop laughing. That the whole story how we came here. Is, was it in June 1926 that you went to study with him? What happened? How did you, did you write to him? No, I didn't write. I simply went there. And I didn't have anything special. I arrived there. You lived in Brussels. You know, Zut. You know Zut, near uh, Ostende. And uh, I rang the, the bell, and the bell, and the lady came. She says, what do you want? I said, I would like to play for Le Maître. And Le Maître was asleep after lunch. He was always bathing. In, um, and I said, if she says, he will not listen to you because he's too tired after the lunch. And I obviously was upset. I showed that I upset. I probably mm, talked too, too loud. And he came out absolutely naked. He says, what is the wrong? What's trouble? I said, she says, um, um, the little boy wants to play for you. And he said, why, why, should, why do you want him not to play? She says, if he doesn't play well, we send him home. He plays well. Come here. And... Uh, when I asked, when he told me, what do you want to play? I said, Paganini. He said, which one you will play? I said, Metro, what, what caprice you want me to play? It sounded a little bit impertinent. But I really, I did play all the caprices. Even now, I could play half of them. That's how I played, and he was very glad. He said, why don't you come tonight to play chamber music? The Queen will play second violin, and you play viola, and I play the first violin. Catastrophe, because he was drinking vino, vino rosso, and and she could, couldn't play violin, and, and the cherries was very bad. Everything was catastrophe. But uh, at so certain time, it was not very good, and we stopped. He they said to the queen, "My petite, my little one," he says, "Wait a moment." For me, it was strange. I wouldn't say that to Queen, my little one, but he was very, very popular in, you know, at that time generally. But and um, he gave me a big viola to play. I couldn't even stretch a hand because he used to play viola also. But he was a big fellow, but hands very big. How long did you study with him? Three days, no, three weeks. I didn't study with him. He didn't tell me anything. But did you enjoy it? Yeah, I enjoyed his personality, not so much in music. You know, he used to, he used to, how do you call it? As I said before, tune the violin with temperament. That's why his violin never was tuned. Beautiful. But he was very extraordinary man. In, the, in Russia, in Odessa, after the concert, he came out, he was a great police with the fur. Took the watch, he says. You have to go home, sleep. I believe he went to a nightclub because somebody saw you in that nightclub. And so, 
his eye left a lasting impression on his young audience, and Odessa's musical son remembered the famous visitor for his personality, his temperament, and for his playing of Sarasate's introduction and Tarantella. I love that piece. It's, it's, this is a showing off masterpiece of Sarasate, because he did for himself. Lovely. <laughs> Thank you. 
In 1925, after several successful tours of the Soviet Union, two children of the revolution, Vladimir Horovitz and Natan Milstein, were sent abroad for purposes of artistic refinement and cultural propaganda. Assistant of um, Trotsky was Uborevich, a Russian general. And he said, why don't you go to aus to aus outside of Russia for pub, I call it, for finishing your studies in, um, and some showing that Soviet is not only materialistic. Not long afterwards, they found themselves in a box at a concert of Fritz Chrysler's in Paris, and the experience was to have lasting effect. There was a concert, Chrysler in Grand Opera, Paris, and he played three concertos. And with Horowitz, we sat in the box. And when we were so fascinated, hypnotized, that after they finished everything, after applause, we sat like that. And there was an old man, Usher, and he says, gentlemen, you know the concert is over. And we couldn't do anything. We were so impressed. In your book, you imply that the impression that concert made on you was one of the reasons for deciding to remain in the West. No. I, made, I decided to be in the West because after Rakovsky, uh, Soviet ambassador, told us, don't go yet, it's, you didn't play enough for the capitalist. It came another ambassador, Soviet, who used to take people from the street and send them to Russia. It was a Stalin regime. And we decided not to go. Christ, maybe indirectly, Christ influenced also. And so the children of the Soviet Revolution remained in the West, lighting fires of enthusiasm wherever they went. And as they grew up, they lost their youthful title. And with Grigor Piatigorsky, acquired the new affectionate label of the Three Musketeers. Piatigorsky was like Niagara Falls, like Natan describes uh, Horowitz, the play, but Piatigorsky as a human being was like that. The first time I met him, he took me like that and squeezed me out. And so much love and so much tenderness, so much wit, he was unique really in a way. And being so tall and so strong, it was impressive. But what was the touching moment is when Nathan gave a master classes in Zurich. Towards the end, Patty goes, he had lung cancer. He smoked a lot all day long. And he knew that he doesn't have much to live. So Nathan said, look, my friend Patty Gorski, he's not well, but maybe he will come. They called Piatti Gorski in California. I said, I'll come, but not for master classes, only to see Natanchik, because I know I'm very sick. So he arrived, and he gave a few master classes, but not many. But then he used to sit at the back to listen to Natan's master class. And one day, he says, Natanchik, let's pay for the students Rosemary, a song, you know, that they played when they were very young. He got up, he went there, he took a cello from the student and he started to play. Oh, Rosemary. And that was a moment I can't forget. I was in tears knowing that he's going to die soon. He returned to California. Two weeks later, he was dead. And I still have a letter from Jacqueline, his wife. He married one of the Rothschild. And she says that Goski had only one friend that he really loved, and it was Natanchik. I kept it, and that's a moment I always remember. And so the first of the three musketeers, who so lit up the musical world in the 1920s, fell silent. Grigor Piatigorsky died in Los Angeles in 1976, at the age of 73. Natan Milstein and Vladimir Horowitz lost a lifelong friend and the world lost one of the most glorious cello talents of the 20th century. 
13 years later, Vladimir Horowitz died in New York at the age of 85. And in 1987, when he was 83, and still playing as the grandest of grandmasters, Natan Milstein's performing career suddenly ended because of an accident to his left hand. But after a career that rose and continued to rise steadily for 73 years, he remains as close to music as his circumstances will allow. He continues to listen with passion, to encourage and guide young players, and he continues to work at his miraculous transcriptions for the instrument which he loves so dearly. If I don't like a piece, I don't transcribe. But if I like a piece, and I think it can be better than the violin, I transcribe it. And most of the time, when I think like that, it's successful. How did you come to transcribe the piece from Tchaikovsky's Mazeppa? Oh, because I, Mr. Horowitz gave me Tchaikovsky's uh, opera manuscript. And there I saw that Mazepa had a daughter. And she was in love with one of his officers. And that's during a war, many, many centuries ago. She came to visit the headquarters and asked him, the father, about her boyfriend. And he said, unfortunately, the boy was killed in the battle. And it's very upset, obviously, shattered. She come through the forest home. And then in the forest, there were hundreds of soldiers crying and moaning. And she somehow blindly approached one that she thought that it's her boyfriend. And she starts, then she thinks. <laughs> but this is, she says, Spim Ladenitz. Uh, I will try to translate from Russian. Spi mladen is my prekrasny. Sleep, my baby, my child. Glorious, beautiful. Bayushki bayu. It's very spooky when the, when the flu does a tira, you know.
Tell me, Nathan Mironovich, do you think about death? Death? I rarely, but I, but when you are old already, you, you're forced to think a little bit. I generally, I don't attract, it doesn't attract me. But I can't help it. That's the end, anyway. It's like a rent, you rent your life. And then the time comes that you have to give up your uh, apartment. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, uh, it's not so forever. But I don't regret the, the past. I never regret because it was very lovely for me. And then after, I was occupied with something that was so dear to me that now, music. I was young by music, middle-aged music, and old-aged music. Good life? I think so. I, I can't be sure. <laughs> but I think it's good. But if, if you love music, it's already something good. If you love music, you, you're, you're more completed without it. Nathan Miranovich. Thank you. Спасибо большое. Пожалуйста. Take off that machinery. <laughs>